Blade Defender? It's the newest of the smash hit home video games that just keep coming, only from Atari. He's better than me. Have you played Atari today? Welcome to 8-Bit, a channel covering all the tips, tricks, and everything in between for programming your own games for the Atari 2600 from 1977. In this episode, we uncover the audio capabilities of the system and how you can make your games more lively and engaging by adding sound effects. That's all coming up on this episode of 8 Blit. If you remember sitting on your floor, tethered to your TV by a slightly broken Atari joystick in your hands, that seems to make a rattling noise as you excitedly sway your upper body with every move, captivated by the action and glow of the screen, and dreaming of one day making your own games for the Atari 2600, then you've found the right channel. We explore the technology and history of arguably one of the most iconic game consoles ever made. It's a flashback to when things were simple, when your fridge always had a Tupperware pitcher full of Kool-Aid, the house was full of rubber tree plants, and your friends would come by, Play Atari. Click on the subscribe button, including that little bell to stay up to date with new episodes and to gain access to tutorials with a ton of code examples. If you'd like to support future episodes capturing the intrepid spirit of Atari from the 70s and right through the 80s, then please consider joining us on Patreon. More information on how you can become a patron today in the video description. In 1951, Christopher Stracci, a friend of Alan Turing, wrote a program to play chess on a Ferenti Mark I computer in Manchester, England. At the conclusion of each game, it would play God Save the King. I couldn't find a recording of the Mark I playing the song, but what you're hearing was recorded from Turing's prototype Mark II computer. According to a very quick Google search, no other video game could match this amazing feat until 1972, with the game Pong created by Alan Alcorn while working at Atari. If you know of an earlier system with sound, let us know in the comments. Since the early days of pops and buzzers, sound circuits became ever more complex on each iteration of consoles, with today's game's audio being recorded on Hollywood-like sound stages by professional folly artists and music scores performed by prestigious orchestras. We've come a long way since our rudimentary bloops and bleeps, so far that my clothes dryer has better capabilities and fidelity than our beloved Atari 2600. Somehow though, despite the odds, the distinctive sound of the Atari 2600 is tightly ingrained into our wistful youth. Let's have a look at the specifications and hardware. Internally, the sound is generated by the Television Interface Adapter Chip, or TIA for short. The TIA features two independent audio channels, which would be great for stereo sound, but unfortunately the traces on the circuit board where the two output pins on the TIA connect or joined resulting in a combined mono signal, which is routed through the RF output to your television. There are some hacks to restore stereo sound on the 2600 and even install two speakers in the case. Did you notice both the heavy and light sixers have grill holes for speakers? We'll cover those in a future episode, so make sure you're subscribed. Each channel has three registers which specify the type, pitch, and volume of the sound. The volume register is 4-bit, giving you 16 steps of granularity. The pitch register is 5-bits, giving 32 possible values. And finally, the type of sound generated is set using the control register, which is 4-bits, and allows you to choose from several pure tones or noises. Before we talk about the different types of tones and noises, it's nice to see how those sounds are created. For many years now, we've used waveforms of sounds or music in our games, literally playing back recorded audio of sound. Before that, we had FM synthesis, which used modulator and sine wave carrier oscillators to reproduce a wide range of sounds. The Atari 2600 uses another method, linear feedback shift registers, or also commonly referred to as polynomial counters. If you've watched our previous episode on pseudo-random numbers and linear feedback shift registers, then this will be very familiar to you. If you haven't, then I suggest you give it a watch after this episode. I'll include a link in the description. The shift register essentially generates the waveform pattern using individual bits, shifting one at a time. 
pulsing either high or low, initiating the movement of the speaker's cone, which ultimately generates sound we hear. The speed at which these bits are shifted are determined by which clock they use, either based on the CPU clock or the pixel clock, and the pitch value determines how often the bits will shift in relation to the clock, generating a wider or more narrow waveform. Let's have a look at the different sounds the TIA makes available to us. In theory, the Atari 2600 has 16 sounds, but several of them are the same. In reality, we actually have only nine distinct sounds. Sound one is like a slightly gritty buzzer. Sounds two and three resemble a running motor with number three playing in a higher octave. Sounds four and five are a high-pitched ringing tone, like a clarinet. Sounds six and 10 are a lower-pitched buzzing tone, perhaps like a bass clarinet. Sounds seven and nine are a harsh buzzing tone, resembling a game show buzzer. Sound eight is a fast fluctuating noise, maybe like a tractor beam. Sounds 12 and 13 are a high pitched tone, like a recorder. Sounds 14 and 15 are a lower pitched noise, like a buzzer, with 15 sounding more harsh and metallic. Now that we know what the Atari 2600 is capable of and the different sounds it can generate, let's look at a pretty basic example. For this, we're going to return to our bouncing ball code from the previous episode and add a sound whenever a collision occurs. Let's scroll to where we handle our collisions. First, we'll load the accumulator with a value of four and then store that into the channel zero audio control, frequency and volume registers. We'll then set a variable to store a value indicating if a sound should be playing or not. It really is that easy to generate sound. But before we get too carried away, we're gonna to want to be able to stop the sound or it's gonna get really annoying really fast. Let's move up a bit to the start of our frame. Here, we're gonna load a variable that will tell us if a sound should be playing. If the value is zero, then we already know there's no sound. So we'll jump ahead. However, if the value is one greater, then we'll decrease that value by one. Then we check if the result is greater than one and the sound should still be playing. If it is, then we'll jump ahead. If the result was zero, then we'll load the accumulator with zero and store it in the channel zero's volume register, which turns off the sound. When we compile and run our code, it looks like this. makes our game a lot more interesting when we can actually hear the ball colliding with the balls. With this sound, you can perceive the ball being small and metallic or glass, adding a whole new dimension to your game using simple sound cues. Let's clean up the code a bit and extend this to other areas with more sounds and use the second channel. First, we're gonna start off by defining some sounds. For this, we'll use a data table. You can call them byte tables, byte arrays, whatever you want. I probably call it something different every time. If you have a preferred nomenclature, then please let me know in the comments below and maybe I'll start sticking to a ubiquitous language. We're defining four different sounds with one table for each register and another to define how many frames we want the sound to play. The bytes in each table represent which sound we're going to play, one for bounces, reset, previous arena, and next arena. Next, we'll define a subroutine to set up a sound to play. This subroutine takes in two parameters. Y selects which of the four sounds we want to set up, and X determines which channel we want to play the sound. We're going to load the accumulator with a value from sound bank type by using Y as the offset. What this does, it starts at the address defined by sound bank type, and then moves up by Y bytes. For example, if sound bank type is at address F200 and Y is two, then we would load the value of the byte located at F202 into the accumulator. We do the same for storing our byte in the accumulator in the audio control register, but this time we'll use X as the offset. If X happens to be zero, then we'd store the value in the channel zero register. 
if x is 1, then it would store the value into an address which is one byte after the channel 0 address, which would be the channel 1 address. We continue to use this pattern for volume, frequency, and sound length before returning execution back to the caller. Now, let's have a look at how we call the subroutine. Our code is a little easier this time. All we need to do is set the channel in X and which sound we want in Y. Since we're supporting two channels in our game, we had to review our code to stop the sound when it time runs out. For this, we created another subroutine. The logic behind this is the same as the previous example. We're going to determine if the sound is playing or if it should be turned off. If it should be stopped, then we'll set the volume to zero. The difference is that we're going to do this for both channels by using X as our channel offset. After we've handled channel one, then we decrease X and handle channel zero. When we decrease X by one more, which brings it to zero, where our branch instruction will let us out of the loop and return execution to the call. Just like our previous example, We'll check if we need to turn off the sound at the beginning of each frame, this time just calling our subroutine. Bringing that all together, it looks and sounds like this. This episode demonstrates only the fundamental audio capabilities of the Atari 2600. In future episodes, we'll do a deeper dive on how to create complex sounds and even compose music for your game. If you found the video interesting, I'd appreciate it if you'd hit that like button and share this episode with your friends or online communities like Facebook, Reddit, or Discord. Anywhere retro gaming and programming enthusiasts hang out. If you haven't already done so, subscribe to the channel and hit that bell to make sure you're notified when a new video comes out. And finally, help keep history alive by supporting future episodes and becoming a patron. I'm excited to start a larger project which will spread out over a series of future episodes. It's gonna be a lot of work and there's lots of technical challenges to overcome. Details of the project and more will be made available to our supporters on Patreon as the project progresses. Your contribution is greatly appreciated. Information on becoming a patron is in the video description. That's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you later.